Welcome everybody to the Standards and Specifications Forum microconference here at Open Source Summit Europe. This is our second microconference for the Standards and Specifications Forum. Our first was held in North America. The crowd was thinner um, there. I think we have a lot more interest and engagement in the EU for this kind of work. Um, and so I'm really excited with the turnout, <laughs> especially since we have so many great talks that we're competing against. Yay! Um, as we get started and y'all trickle in, um, I want to say um, welcome and thank you. Um, and thank you in particular to our program committee. We really pulled together folks from different organizations, not just like from within the Linux Foundation, but also, as you can see, Samina Hussein, a good friend of mine at ECMA International, the Secretary General there, um, Kelly Kulian, who's from um, Oasis Open and helping to drive open source and specification projects for Oasis, um, Kim Hamilton Duffy, who's part of uh, the distributed executive director of Distributed Identity Foundation, um, my colleague Seth Newberry who is a mentor to a number of projects on their own specification journey. And then, of course, Mirko Baum from LF Europe, who I think many of you probably have met here at the conference today. So thank you to our program committee. Um, I realized I didn't introduce myself. My name is Jory Burson. I'm the VP of Standards for the Linux Foundation, and um, I help our specification-enabled projects sort of um, achieve their goals and outcomes. Um, so if you are interested to hear more about that, just let me know. I want to invite you all to take our 2024 State of Open Standards survey. Um, we, this is our second year for this uh, report. First report was in 2023, and we hope to um, complete data collection and uh, publish this report in November. Um, we've got several hundred responses so far, but we could really use your voice. We want a global representation of responses. So I uh, would very much appreciate you taking this and telling your friends to take it as well. And then um, last but not least, just some quick why. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, the first year that we've hosted this uh, micro conference. Um, and really the, the genesis was a realization that we don't have enough opportunities for standards making organizations, specification developing organizations to get together and share across organizations what we're learning, what the best practices are, how we can um, facilitate collaboration uh, more easily, share uh, and learn from one another. And then secondarily, <coughs> how we can help <laughs> tap and grow and find the next generation of standards professionals because in the IT space, that's uh, not historically been a, a young person's sport, if you will. So um, those are topics that keep me up at night um, and things I'm interested in chatting about. And I hope we are going to hear some great uh, material from our speakers on this track today uh, that address that. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, Shane Coughlin. Uh, I think Shane needs probably no introduction because uh, he is a presence. Shane is going to tell us all about Open Chain uh, and a case study of standardization. Thank you very much, Jory, and everyone. It's it's kind of a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've had a couple of talks in the last few months, most recently on Monday, and all of those talks have sort of fit into the where we've discussed things before, like. You know, open chain standards, how to talk with IP departments, and so on and so forth. This talk differs a little bit because instead of explaining what my community is doing per se, I'm going to talk about some of the mechanisms of how we did what we did. And this is hopefully going to help other people, other projects, individuals, and companies thinking about making their own standards, working out what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, working out who to collaborate with, working out how to debug things as you go. Now, I don't like formal talk stuff. Uh, jump in anytime with questions and comments. 
Uh, don't worry if I make bad jokes. It, it just happens automatically. And don't hesitate to raise difficult topics. There's no stupid question here. Uh, there's no question too difficult. And there's no question, almost no question too weird. Before I go through the how did we go from a, a normal open source community chatting about a problem into a steward of ISO standards, I'm going to explain what we are uh, and set context for the room. For those of you who know OpenChain, um, take a nap. <laughs> five, minutes, five minutes is going to be on this. A little bit of background about myself for those of you uh, who are completely new to who I am. And this is the next couple of slides are meant to set context for why I have some small degree of authority to speak in this field. Um, but obviously, I don't. 20 years ago almost, I founded the legal network of Free Software Foundation Europe. And I led the legal team there, focused on copyright matters. So at that time, open source licenses were kind of maybe going to work almost for sure, probably it's fine. And we, <laughs> Sean knows what I'm talking yeah. about. <laughs> and uh, basically, until, until they were proven in court, there was a lot unknown. And at this period, they were beginning to be proven in court in Germany by Harold Velte and Dr. Till Jaeger via gplviolations.org. So at that period, I started to bring together lawyers in Europe, despite my accent, I'm actually from Dublin, Ireland. And we were collaborating on, now that the licenses are being enforced, now that license compliance and open source is a definite thing, how do we share notes on this? That evolved into launching the first law journal and a law book covering law related to open source licensing matters and similar uh, country by country, et cetera, et cetera. And later, I moved into the patent domain, another aspect of intellectual property, at Open Invention Network, where I focused on, in open source, how do we do things like have patent non-aggression pledges? What all of that means is I had a lot of focus for a lot of my career on intellectual property management around open source. And that boils down to third-party intellectual property management questions of how do we give and how do we protect. Nowadays, I'm the general manager of the Open Chain Project, which means that board members like Helio hiding at the back um, do wonderful support of me to lead this community and try to bring together as much thinking as possible around managing trust in the supply chain. And our optic is fundamentally IP-based. Let me dig into that a little bit. We're concerned in the Open Chain project about the very high-level process management of open source in the supply chain. Fundamental question started back in 2015. In a complex supply chain where trusting compliance information is very difficult, given that open source contains third-party IP, there's an awful lot of it, there's an awful lot of steps in the supply chain, what can we do? And the answer was, let's make a process standard to try to address some of that complexity. Let's deal with 20 years of distilled knowledge at that stage on what type of process points are useful for compliance. It sort of boils down to the very basics of inbound, internal, and outbound, have training, have a policy, have people responsible. That's not quantum chromodynamics, but it is useful to codify it and try to align everyone across the same process inflection points and dramatically reduce the number of errors around risk and intellectual property, open source, and the supply chain end up with a more trusted supply chain. The compliance activity we did started on license compliance, and then later we moved into security compliance, or to use the lingo of the domain, security assurance. Both of these problems were related to big fires around open source process management in supply chain. 
These are issues that affect all companies in all sectors. And as it turns out, it was, relatively speaking, easy to find common solutions that would suit companies of all sizes. Now, you can find out more about our standards at these QR codes. These slides have so many QR codes. It's <laughs> awesome. You'll find them on the Open Chain website later as well. Uh, basically, we created, with our first standard and continued with our second, a way to have flexible standards that aren't prescriptive about how to do something. They identify process points. They give you the minimal viable product to get a compliance program of some sort off the ground, license compliance, security compliance, et cetera, et cetera. And as you might have gathered by now, what we were doing in this high-level approach that's suitable for all companies is beginning to sound inherently suitable, as it was, for making standards. And of course, ISO standards are very useful. And the reason that we went from de facto industry standards into ISO standards was that instead of having to explain something from first principle, if something is an ISO standard, it's very easy for companies across the supply chain to understand this ISO number, which is a respected standard, is something we can include in our procurement process. It's something our IP can easily fit into their broader portfolio of standards. Very brief note on the progress, because it's one thing to make a standard, it's another thing to have it work and for it to be adopted. When it comes to our progress, we formally launched a long time ago, about 2016. We were de facto industry standard with a, an openly available specification until 2019, and we became an ISO standard in 2020. We've had a lot of progress. For instance, just this week, we had Nokia announce conformance to our ISO standard for open source license compliance. Uh, we've had Open Harmony announce conformance yesterday. Interesting, because that's a project, not a company, indicating, again, the universal applicability of these process points. Uh, last week, I think it was, Samsung SDS announced adoption of our security standard, which is a much newer ISO standard that came out in uh, December 2023. Anyway, long story short, lots of companies adopting the standards, lots of companies coming to us and saying, oh, you can or please do display our logo on your website, lots of companies encouraging the supply chain to adopt these common processes. A successful approach. PwC did a survey two years ago, and it indicated that from the survey sample, 31% of German companies with over 2,000 employees were already using or planning to use our ISO standard for open source license compliance. Here I pause for Sean to take a photo. <laughs> Nicely done, my friend. Okay, we're nearly finished the boring bit. <laughs> the adoption methods for our standards are varied. Uh, for instance, there's a bit of a spectrum of how you can adopt a standard. In our case, the most common methodology is self-certification. There's also independent assessment where, for instance, a consultancy or other organization helps you self-certify. And then there's third-party certification where a certifier like TÜVSUD, TÜVNORD, Buno Veritas, PwC, they come in and they do the certification for you. We have a broad support network around what we do. For example, of course, fundamentally, we're supported as a project by our Platinum members. There's 23 of them. Big thanks to all of those, including those in the room. And they provide strategic input, strategic support, and uh, some capital for us to maintain the standards, advocate for the standards, and so on. Most importantly, we have a very large community. We build open standards in an open way, and that means that the user companies using our outputs are the people who create them. We have regional work groups, we have industry work groups, and we have overarching things like our specification work group. Uh, the, the membership of this is very easy. You turn up, and then you're part of it. So if someone wants to contribute to thinking around our standards or reference material or other activities, they just come. 
do it and are part of what we are doing on an ongoing basis. Uh, one quick example, our Japan work group is about 200 people, 120 companies. Our China work group is currently 335 people from around 200 companies. And Korea is somewhere in the region of 170 people from a little over 100 companies. And, and these are you know, work groups that meet relatively often and communicate virtually quite actively. We have presence in North America. We have presence in Europe. And we have, of course, as I just mentioned, presence in Asia. The work we do relies on this central pillar, but it's also supported by things like our official partners. And we have extensive uh, support through our partner program. We have, for instance, 15 third-party certifiers, allowing at least three different choices in every geography in the world regarding third-party certification on our standards from organizations that actively work with us. Uh, quick example, our third-party certifier PWC is lending us one of their rooms tomorrow to hold our board meeting. So we're, we're collaborating with everyone everywhere to uh, provide the type of network, the type of support that allows us to create the standards, ensure you have choice if you need help adopting them, and boost the community's ability to do stuff. Just last week, we were in Stuttgart, hosted by Bosch, and we had just the most fabulous meeting of automotive supply chain, where people got together, talked about open chain, talked about things like software-defined vehicles, and et cetera, et cetera. Reference material, of course, helps people use the standards. That makes sure that everyone arriving and looking at something like an ISO standard uh, on our website doesn't get overwhelmed. Whether it's a checklist that summarizes the requirements of the specifications, or example training material, or policy templates, it's all available. And everything that isn't, for instance, the actual standard, or a case study naming what a company did, everything else is CC0. So people can just ingest it into whatever they're doing and alter it as they see fit. So, long story short, we were solving for risk management in the supply chain. Our optic was, how do you do open source compliance? Our starting point, open source license compliance. Later, the question of security compliance came up, and we made a sister standard for security assurance. This was done with a community in an open source way, and led from de facto standards, specifications freely available, into ISO standards. That, as was probably clear, happens by bringing people together and solving the challenges together. So we brought a community of common interest together and we went from nothing at all into an ISO standard, and two ISO standards now. So I'm going to run you through about how that happened in the Open Chain project. You've seen what the output is. Now let's talk about how we actually got there. So that's our little case study today. And that will hopefully be a little bit of fun and perhaps informative. Or not, and not. Let's see. <laughs> day, day one, uh, people came together for a chat. It actually started around 2015, I believe. Um, it was David Marr uh, from Qualcomm and a bunch of other people got together and started talking about the common challenge of a supply chain where some companies were really good at open source license compliance and the majority of the supply chain was not really good at open source license compliance. And the fundamental question was, given that no one company can fix a supply chain, was there a way for a bunch of companies to find a way to guide the supply chain in a positive manner? And that discussion evolved into, what if we distilled all of the experience and knowledge we have into something to help? What if we found a way to align people around methods that we know work? So this, this evolved into the concept of, let's do something for process management based on our experience 
that can allow other parties who don't have that experience to benefit from it and hopefully align the supply chain on the practices we know will lead to good license compliance. A simple idea took only one day. Everything's fine. It, it only takes seven days to make an ISO standard. Don't worry about it. Jory will deal with it. <laughs> day two, <laughs> Mark Giese from Wind River stepped forward and was the community chair on drafting the proposed specification. And that's a really tough job. Because when you say we're going to do something like, let's make a spec that explains all the important things to do around license compliance, you're immediately going to get like 150 checklist items. And you're going to look at that and think, no one in this universe will ever use this checklist. So Mark, to his credit, uh, stepped forward and dealt with all of the wonderful ideas, but sort of you know polished the diamond down to the minimal viable product. And that process took a long time. It takes a long time to do that. The Open Chain project um, worked for over a year, and it was incubated in the Linux Foundation for about six months before launch, polishing and polishing this idea of what could we do to get this short summary of key process material. There were very frequent calls and there was a mailing list to brainstorm this. And I, I was there for a lot of the calls. And it was, it was quite exciting. You know, you had companies like Arm and Samsung providing slide decks of their training, their distilled knowledge, and all of the parties looking at this knowledge and saying, on one hand, how can we extract the key process points? On the other hand, how can we take these slide decks from Qualcomm, Arm, Samsung, and squish them and distill them into reference training as well. Lots of exciting stuff. By October 2016, it was ready in its first draft. We had a process specification explaining how to do the key requirements of a quality open source license compliance program. And that was the launch of the Open Chain project as we know it today. Now, so far, so normal, right? This is like any open source project, except instead of code, we're building a specification. The interesting thing is that when you build a specification and it begins to get traction, as we found, you begin to think about what's next. You have a de facto industry standard emerging. You have a bunch of companies directly involved in maintaining a project around it you have a bunch of companies involved in adopting it. And it seems to be growing in a positive way across different industry verticals. And that's the tipping point where you begin to ask the important question of, is there more to this than just having an open project and a freely available specification? Is there a way we can grow this, codify this further, for the improvement of the industry. So this is day four. So it's uh, Thursday. <laughs> On Friday, Rudin turned up. <laughs> <laughs> so David Rudin from Microsoft is, is super awesome. And he has a wealth of experience around standardization, but also around open source. And you know he came to the table with some great knowledge and experience around his work founding the Joint Development Foundation, around his work more generally in the standards field. And he helped our board consider the value of taking our momentum and going from this de facto standard into a formal ISO standard. And as it happened, uh, JDF, Saturday, was a mechanism that could allow us to accomplish this. There's a thing called the JTC1 pass transposition process. Um, and we entered that through JDF uh, to become an ISO standard. Now, the actual details of the pass transposition process in JTC1 are not something I'm going to go into in this call for two reasons. It's lengthy. And two, Jory's there, and she'll answer your emails. <laughs> it's fine. I don't have to do that. But the very short version 
is that if you have something that is a de facto industry standard, uh, you can find an organization that is a past submitter, like Joint Development Foundation, and talk about whether what you're doing is appropriate to potentially move into being a formal standard. And we received terrific support from JDF. We had Seth at JDF itself, and we had Rex, who was our consultant, our editor of the spec, helping us understand where we are today, how to do the application, how to format our specification appropriately, and so on and so forth. This QR code leads to the Joint Development Foundation website, where you can find out not only more about what they do and how they do it, but you can also see a bunch of projects that are under their umbrella. Uh, they, they do a lot. And that's why I keep picking on Jory. She's the, she's the overlord. <laughs> Our result by Sunday was an ISO standard. And we had a very smooth process through the JTC1 past transposition process. One was because of overarching support from JDF. You know, what Rudin and others had built there was an organization that could support an open source style project into going into formal standardization. We also had instant success based on many, many years of careful, cautious, conservative effort. We built our specification, the first version, and launched it in late 2016. We got market feedback, and we revised it several times between that point and when we got into the JTC1 pass transposition process. We revised it based on market feedback, whether it was about adjusting some of the terminology for scope or adjusting some of the terminology for linguistic clarity, and so on and so forth. We spent years, and Gizi counted the contributors. We had over 120 contributors helping us work on the spec directly, not counting people on reference material and other stuff like that. So we had years and years of finessing this thing, documenting it openly in meetings, recordings, later GitHub, that led us to a very smooth ISO submission process. And that, I think, is bring me to the point I want to give to you. When you think about standardization, in our context as the open source community, you want to make sure that you know exactly what you're doing. You want a very clear goal and a very clear challenge that you're addressing. You don't want to try to solve all of the problems. We scope really narrowly. If you look at both of our ISO standards, they're like five pages long. We're high-level process standards. As I mentioned at the very beginning of our talk, we're at the top of the pyramid. We're at the what, not the how. And you know, we say, for instance, have an S-bomb, and there we stop. Companies can then go into the how, and they can look at, for instance, S-bomb standards like SPDX. So we help set context at a high level we knew that from day one. We knew exactly that we were doing the what and not the how. The separation meant that we had no confusion in building our community specification. We had no confusion in trying to solve all the problems. We had no issue where we were inadvertently becoming incoherent, overbearing, prescriptive, and so on. To be honest, we benefited a great deal uh, from people who'd done a lot of standardization. I mentioned that the initial conversation started with David Marr at Qualcomm, highly experienced in standards. I called out, for instance, uh, you know, we had David Rudin, highly experienced in standards. All the way through, we had these people at the, at the table, and they really helped us. And Mark Giese, special credit, who was the first spec chair. Uh, Mark, if you're watching this, pedantic. <laughs> conservative, <laughs> exactly what you need. Mark was um, always, always, every call, opening the document, taking the feedback, and doing what's most common, I think, in any standards project, saying no <laughs> politely, as great ideas would come in, but they're not appropriate. So whittle down. 
executing against very clear processes. We always had a structured process listed in our FAQ about how we approach this. How do we write the standard? How do we do a uh, public comment period? How do we do things like the freeze period? So that it was auditable. We scoped our work based on market response. When we changed and evolved our de facto standard, it wasn't based on getting excited as we saw adoption. It was based on people coming to us and saying, we need a little more, we need a little change. So we kept it very, very real, very practical. And finally, the most important point, working with other people, whether it was inside our community or later, more importantly, outside our community, like building good relationships with JTC1, talking with people at BSI or uh, DIN in Germany, having conversations in the case of submitting our security standard, before we submitted it through the JTC1 pass transposition process, we provided it to JTC1 subcommittee 27, information technology security, for alignment. We said to them, uh, can we make sure this doesn't overlap or contradict anything you're doing? That kind of respectful activity, going out there, talking with other people, was key to making sure that what we did was meaningful and it worked with what others were doing, playing nicely with them. And I think that's the key thing I'd highlight. Anyone can get together to solve a problem and build a community with caution. Anyone can be successful if there's real dark market demand. And anyone can evolve into potentially having an international standard if they play nice with others and, and deal with the fact that it's such a complex world out there and so many people are working in good faith. It's very, very important to do that and to know when what you're doing is appropriate to fit into solving the problem, either as a standard or reference material or guide, etc., etc. Right. Now, nothing is static if you want to continue to be alive tomorrow, and OpenChain is not static either. So one example of how a project that builds standards continues its work is that we're in a public comment period for proposed draft updates to both of our standards at this moment. And that is part of the process management that allows people to know what we're up to very clearly and to have very clearly defined ways to communicate their ideas and suggestions. We spent two years taking feedback on both of the specifications, talking about what people might want next. Then we move into the six month public comment period. Then we'll move into a three month freeze period. And then we take it to our steering committee who will look at the result of that and decide if they'll take the draft specifications into updates to one or both of the ISO standards or send them into re-editing or et cetera, et cetera. Everything is clearly defined. If you go to our website, you'll find the FAQ outlining this, outlining how we set up study groups, outlining how we set up work groups, et cetera, et cetera. Very predictable. Now, while we're a little bit rigid, purposefully so, on addressing these matters, it doesn't mean that we're entirely rigid in considering other aspects of the future. I mentioned compliance, and I said license compliance. And then I mentioned security compliance, which we call security assurance because that's the lingo of the field. There are other topics that our supply chain community come to us and say we want to talk about. For instance, right now, Dave Marr and Matthew Crawford of ARM are talking about AI. Now, fundamentally, what they're talking about in our study group, which is studying the problem, is AI compliance in the supply chain. Fundamentally, what they're talking about is basically AI bill of material management. If your suppliers are promising that their new AI XYZ has magic solution B, do you have a policy and process to double check what ingesting that would mean to you? you know, are you able to check the license? Is someone somewhere responsible for that? Do you make a record of that? Do you have a policy to make sure that fits. 
this study group is talking about that challenge, which is very distinct from talking about is AI open or what AI is the best. Completely different topic. This is about trust in the supply chain from a compliance optic. What's coming in and what's my policy for dealing with this? And do we have people trained and responsible? They're talking about this. Um, at this juncture, remember study group. They're not making a work product on it. But they are considering becoming a work group and working on a guide in this space, which is something we have done and continue to do around the Open Chain project. I'm going to come back to the guide thing in just one moment, because then we're going to have to talk about Nokia. <laughs> uh, we have an SBOM study group, which is pretty new. It just launched. OpenChain has been deeply involved in SBOM activity since we began. We mandated SBOMs since 2016 in our standards. We always have. We don't mandate the format. We mandate the fact you must have one. We have, in our community, created things like the SPDX Lite uh, profile for the SPDX project to describe the minimum amount of SBOM you might need if you're dealing with a tiny supplier who's going to send you an Excel spreadsheet. That's something that we needed. I'm, I'm a Japanese resident. That's something we needed in Japan because most of the supply chain is tiny companies that send you a, a bill of materials in an Excel spreadsheet. We've done things like the Telco SBOM guide, which is a very new work product, and that defines what's a quality SBOM. You know, what's the minimum you sort of need to match things like the NTIA requirements plus your license compliance requirements? What is it that you need? And Mark Etion, the chair of Telco's right there, it's his fault. <laughs> but it's it's remarkable work. And you know, in that case, that telco guide was swiftly followed by uh, a validator from Nokia to check if an SBOM matched the requirements of that guide. This study group is noodling on this stuff and talking about when we talk about using SBOMs in production, what's a quality SBOM? Do we make more material for guidance here? Do we become an SBOM work group and make more guides, et cetera, et cetera? I think that's one to stick a pin in it and say CRA, SBOM discussion, that's probably going to be something they cover in future study groups. Next meeting, September 25th. So lots of stuff. We keep fresh. We evolve our existing standards. We keep our eyes open. If we're building a trusted supply chain, compliance optic, is there somewhere we can contribute with a guide? At some point in the future, someone could say, can we contribute with a new specification? The answer is maybe. Our job isn't to make more standards. Our job is to help solve the market problem. Is it a guide? Is it a standard? Et cetera, et cetera. It depends. Not everything should be a standard, by the way, which is another lesson. OK, wrapping up, uh, if you have people who want to learn more about the compliance optic of open source process management, you can send them here. Send them to Japan next month. We'll have the Open Compliance Summit. It's a Chatham House Rule event capped at 120 people maximum, where we get together for two days, talk in very practical ways about what's going on in the market, and try to ensure people come out with tools, um, obviously not physical, but tools, to address the challenges in their companies. Some of it is related to Open Chain. Some of it's related to other LF projects, like, for instance, SPDX. And some of it's related to completely different things happening in the ecosystem. Well worth a look. Right, conclusion, finally. Uh, we have had a remarkable chance to adjust the supply chain by getting the type of knowledge that can help companies that was previously only in a handful of companies and sharing it with everyone. As that community grew, we were enabled to develop new knowledge and new solutions in a linear manner. We kept it structured, we kept it regulated, we kept it auditable. We made sure that people would know exactly what was going on and could go back through our history. And because of that, we were able to make standards that are trusted around the world. Everything shouldn't be a standard, but some things should. And our project is one example of a domain where something could be a standard, became an industry standard, and then became a formal ISO standard in collaboration with JDF. 
If you have questions about how we did that in detail, I'm happy to answer them at any time. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's not too forward of me to say that, for instance, Jory and myself are always available just to shoot the breeze on this. You know, so there's some great ideas that could potentially be future standards. There's some great ideas that probably don't fit into the optic of standards. And that's the type of conversation the open source community, I think, can really value. And it's one of the great things that we have here in LF, with JDF available to everyone. Uh, you, you can get started. You can use things like the community specification and get started if you're in the right space solving the right problem. Okay, I'm out of time. I'll stop there. If people have any questions, is it okay? Yeah. All righty. Does anyone have any questions about this stuff? Hey, hey, Bruce. So Yes. Let's refer to what maybe is a slight meta standards of both right. which many others will reference and incorporate. What if you're working lower down the chain yes. and you are trying to create standards using these open source collaborative techniques to form, you know, maybe with the ISO or uh, IEC as your target, where you are in some sense maybe seen as elbowing in across the territory of to um, the processes that one might uh, be best to, to pursue in terms of engaging with those groups. Right. Because sometimes, I'm talking from the energy sector, um, some of these standards go back a long way. Right. There's some very fixed mindsets in yeah. those organizations. Whereas if you're coming in on the top and talking about things that they don't need to contest on, or in fact, they don't know until you define it, we are coming in and saying, well, there is a space here. In fact, the energy system is changing in ways that these standards Right. So if you can speak to how a group like ours would best um, pro proceed in that, at that level in the future. Right. This, it's a, such a great question. And at my talk two days ago, you guys had good questions too. Okay, so some context for those who aren't familiar with energy. I mean, I was very fortunate to work uh, quite closely with Shuli Goodman, the first leader of LF Energy. Uh, and to have some great conversations with companies in the sector. Context, in the energy sector, there's huge capital investment. So it's an enormously expensive place to operate. It's like medical. You put many, many billions into doing something, uh, and therefore there's understandable caution and hesitation about change. You know, you're looking at a very, very long investment horizon. You're looking at enormous sums before anyone can become profitable, and so on and so forth. So it's a very cautious sector. It's a very cautious sector. And it's also an old sector, which means it has standards, it has processes, it has its way of doing things. So as stuff like open source and software-defined energy <laughs> turn up, um, things are beginning to move in a new way. And the question is how to manage this and how to, how to how to innovate without causing conflict between parties. And this isn't an uh, industry-specific challenge. It's something that everywhere we have to deal with. As we innovate in any sector, we have to talk about what's useful today, what might be needed in the future. Uh, I know specifically in energy there's some challenges where, you know, for instance, aspects of standards could potentially be used in automation, but the sections of the standards have licensing. It's just that, that example which could be put into automation and that licensing may present a challenge. Can I put that section of the standard into automation? How does that work with the intellectual property of the standard? And, and these, are, these are thorny questions and they're questions which lead to, do, do we look at negotiating with changing the existing standard, do we build a new standard, and so on and so forth. So it's an excellent question because it, it shows in the existing example 
of uh, a real market question, a real market challenge. I think that the best answer is the most political answer, which is that we have to sit down with the stakeholders and build a consensus. And it's genuinely a real question to say, how can we trust a community of people to do something new? Now, I'm going to give an example from OpenChain. Uh, how can we trust a community of people to do something new? Might there be chaos, et cetera, et cetera? It's like, not really. <laughs> this, this is the community. This is what they're like. And I think that in you know, the energy sector, maybe it's a similar conversation. I've seen the membership of LF Energy. It's a lot of giants in there. So bringing the people who've identified the emerging challenge that maybe we need something that isn't there, bringing who they are to the table, going to the other parties and finding that bridge, I think is the best way forward. It's a dialogue thing. And in my impression is that no matter how great an idea we have for anything, it doesn't matter if we can't build um, a community, if we can't build consensus, if we can't build acceptance. So compromise, compromise, compromise. Bring the credibility of the people with new ideas. Go to the people who built the previous stuff and negotiate until there's a compromise. In our case, we were going into white space. No one had done open source license compliance. And when we went into open source security assurance, we were quite frankly nervous, right? There's a lot in security. Would we overlap? Would we cause tension? Would we conflict? Which is one reason we were very keen and very grateful to go to JTC1 SC27, you know, this traditional standardization committee that makes their standards and had lots in the pipeline. And we went to them to make sure we wouldn't step on any toes. And we got cleared. They were like, no, you're not stepping on toes here. Actually, we went to them and said, we're, we're looking at this. We finished editing. We spent a year and a half editing this. We have adoption of the de facto standard. We're looking at submitting, does this conflict with anything? And the answer came back basically, no, it doesn't. And here's a ton of ideas. And we were like, those ideas are great. Next revision. <laughs> But you know, this, this dialogue, I think, was, was super valuable. And if they'd come to us and said, nope, you're, you're going straight up duplicating our work here, we'd have to have sat down and said, OK, in that case, maybe we look at merging our, our innovation, if any, into their work. And I think that's, that's the key. I think, or your work or oh gosh, no, uh, the simple answer, yeah. uh, go straight to JDF. Right. That's been, uh, that's been a, a big help when you start to appreciate that maybe there are some advantages for sort of a, the, the pre standardization activities that happen on the way in, in the open source world. Yep. And they say, okay, you know, and, and to Shane's point, you, you open a dialogue and do so in a way that says, we're not trying to duplicate you, we're not trying to compete with you, we want to just make it easier. Oh, yeah. You can't turn up with an idea and say, this should be an ISO standard. Yeah. 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 
You, yeah, I mean, we always, we wrote our specs, they went to market, people adopted it. This was a case of the industry doing something, then the industry using it, and then being out there enough that we're able to say, yeah. And that's, it, it's a really good thing. And, all, you know, the fundamental motive here is we're solving a problem. And for us, our reason for being wasn't to make an ISO standard. Our reason for being was to solve the supply chain challenge. And the most appropriate mechanism was to make a standard in the end. Oh, yeah. It's like have an S bomb. Look, SPDX. There's a, yeah. We, we, we didn't make stuff up. We, we could point at practical things every step of the way. And, you know, being able to do that and also being willing to say, what I've got is great but it's not appropriate as a standard, that's a good thing because it means your motive is to solve the market problem. And I think that's the key. But the support you guys can get from JDF, you can brainstorm through anything, any part of our process, definitely. And, and you know, here's the thing. Uh, you can track our work. You can be part of it. You can be wallflies. You can do whatever you want. We're a completely open project. Turn up on the calls. Contribute, don't contribute, look at the 90 plus webinars we have on all types of topics, die of boredom perhaps. It's all there. And uh, we're in a position where I got messages from traditional standards orgs like BSI and DIN asking how we did what we did, not because they were feeling unhappy about it, they were just curious about how do you have an open community workflow that isn't chaotic, you know, just these type of things, that's a positive result. And we, we were so welcomed by the SC27 people and their feedback was awesome. Again, I think it's, it's really the conversation. And you're lucky, this is the right place for it. And I wanna give huge credit to the traditional standardization people out there. Uh, you know, open source and the speed at which we move. And now the change in the market is very challenging. And some of the, traditional standardization workflows are challenged by it. Um, and they've been very welcoming to how things like OpenChain can assist in the overarching market. And I think that speaks to the, the open-mindedness and the supportive nature of standardization in general. And we're, we're a tiny part of a growing community. And we're very happy. Alrighty, uh, I think that might be it. So thank you very much.